Well, for me, the fact that uh, the battle of ideas has to have a, a trafficking debate confirms that there has been a huge setback for women. Um, not because so many women are exploited, but because so many women have been willing to accept the story that Natalie alluded to, that vast numbers of women are being rounded up and enslaved. Um, there seems to be something going on in the world in which that it would be acceptable for people to imagine that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of women are unable to choose anything about their lives at all. Now, 50 years ago, I'm looking around and maybe I'm the only person in the room that remembers 50 years ago, but you all have some kind of um, impression about the 1950s, which was considered a very, it's now would be considered a very retrograde kind of period um, in which women were meant to stay at home after being great heroes in the war and working and having full agency and not having to be mothers were now positioned as domestic angels who would take care of the family and who didn't have to, would be pure kind of vessels of motherhood. And, um, and this, the feminists from that period argued that that was a very old fashioned, unfair way to look at women and that women should have equal rights and options um, to leave home, to get jobs, to not have to have children, to not be secondary to men, an entire, to be assertive. I was taught to be assertive, to take responsibility for my own life and, um, and to figure out what you liked about sex. That was one of the things, was that sexual experimentation and not having to be this mother and domestic woman, those were really big things. So now we've got feminists pushing a model of feminism that's worse than that one, in my view. It's worse. It's arguing, and I'm sorry that Julie Bindel isn't here because I wanted to talk to her about it. Um, the argument is that women are inherently sexually vulnerable, that there's something about the biology of women that makes them liable to be penetrated in a dominating, invasive way, that there's something inherent about having a vagina instead of a penis that makes you vulnerable to attack and abuse. Um, there also seems this kind of feminism is pushing an idea that somehow women are unable to weigh options in then are sort of predisposed to be pushed around by anyone from their father to the lover boys or the whatever. It's an unbelievable kind of pushing women back into the past. Um, the other idea that's inherent in this kind of feminism is that if you have sex without love, it's a complete disaster. That you will be abused, if you are abused somehow, then you are damaged for life. That you will not be able to, um, to recuperate. So that the, when poor men leave home and get into trouble, wherever they came from in the world, it is, there's a general expectation that they will surmount obstacles. And there is no such assumption about women. It is assumed that they will immediately be completely smashed and put in chains and have no ability to manipulate or negotiate their way out of those situations. I think it's unbelievable that people are falling for this. And if they are young women, then the next accusation is that they are being robbed of childhood, that there's some wonderful innocence. And I, the idea that people don't realize that in poorer places where you have only a few options, this is not about beautiful neoliberal choice. It's about having a few options and weighing them and deciding which you prefer. So it is not about choice. It is about, okay, I could be a live-in maid, I could sell oranges in the street, or I could sell sex. I'm going to try selling sex. I, I'd like to see if I could make something of that. So does that ever go wrong? Sure. But try being a live-in maid 
that is at least as bad a job as selling sex in a lot of these situations. And people are imagining that somehow, well, since there's no sex involved, which is a lie, a lot of the maids have to have sex with someone, that somehow this is, this is an acceptable um, job. This is the worst kind of neocolonialism. Uh, the idea that this would be coming out of the West, looking at women, particularly women, poor people in the non-West as slaves, or potentially slaves. It's as though everyone is almost a slave. With these images from 200 years ago, scaring us to death that slavery is back, that civilization is coming to an end, that it's all going to fall apart. This is a huge move to the past, with women seen as chattels moved around by men. And built on top of this great idea is a huge industry, which I unwittingly named the rescue industry in this book, and which has, um, it's borne out that it was a metaphor at the time when I wrote this. This is five or six years old now, the, when I wrote it originally. And, but it's now, it's a gigantic industry. So the amount of money that's going into these kind of rescue operations and the number of governments that think they have to, even tightening all other budgets, oh, but we have money to go raid brothels in Cambodia. It's, unbelie it's unbelievable that this, yeah, that some kind of criminal model in which police officers, so this is all positioned as criminal. So, yes, you are a victim of a crime if you really are a victim of a crime. And so then there's a criminal, and then there's, a, so you have a perpetrator and a victim, and you also create the need for someone to come and rescue you. And since it's a criminal framework, those people are police. And so stupid, horrible, violent, upsetting raids are taking place all over the world to rescue brown women from brothels who then get taken to police stations where they won't denounce anyone and want to be left out of it. So it's, it's a gigantic kind of um, narrative about somehow the West's way of living is the best one and we will go police the world and save all the women from this kind of um, stuff. And I, as I said, I see it as a big step backward for women. Thanks. In the, in the 19th century, Josephine Butler um, wanted to save all women who were becoming prostitutes. And the famous thing that she said was that if she had to be a prostitute, she would be crying all day long. And when I have people with those kinds of responses now, I usually say, it is well known that many people find the thought of doing this absolutely appalling and they would be crying all day long and they should stay away from it. They should stay very far away from it. But everyone does not feel the same way about sex. And it turns out that I know this after doing research, not ideology stuff. This is, I started, as a person in Latin America doing research with migrants who had two choices. They knew that they could be a maid or they knew that they could sell sex. And they, do they really know what it's going to be like at the other end? No, no one ever really knows anything. But it is not this extreme kind of idea. There is enormous diversity amongst people who end up doing this stuff. So if you always take the figure of the 12-year-old who was in chains, we will all agree that that's the worst thing you can possibly imagine. But the enormous number of people are in more um, ambiguous situations. And there is enormous amount of ethnographic work. There's hundreds of studies by now in the, all over the world that show that yeah, it's, and I repeat, it's not about wonderful free choices. It's about having a few options and ending up preferring one to the other and some people adapting to it or not. I do, I was, I went over time on, so I didn't say the stuff about migration policy that I was going to. I don't, 
automatically espouse something called open borders because I'm not sure how that would work. But I'm clear that this is a conversation that needs to be about migration policy and the fact that highly skilled migrants are the only ones that are apparently valued when there are so many jobs in non-prestigious so-called non-skilled jobs available which constitute the pull factor for the people from all over the world who know that they can work in the back of a kitchen or in a, as a maid or in construction or agriculture in Europe. And as long as none of those are available for having a work permit, then the idea of migration policy as only wanting good people is, highly skilled people, is the cause of the fact that so many people are constructed as criminal or exploited or whatever. I don't, it seems to me that there would have to be a lot of different kinds of models, not one huge thing called open borders, but maybe we could try some different kinds of policies. I think that this kind of conversation, I always feel, well, you know, can we please talk about something else now? So I'm glad that Camille brought up ideas about organizing. I think there's been a lot of silly stuff said about unions and the problem of unions. Um, it's very difficult to unionize, although there are some efforts that have got somewhere in some countries, and not just trades union, but different kinds of collective getting together and trying to get something done. Um, it's very difficult in any country that has a legal framework that um, doesn't recognize any kind of sex businesses that where it's all taking place in the informal sector so that you can't really go to the police and you can't really object to your boss because that power relationship is really screwed up. So if you accept the diversity, then you could say, okay, well, for the people who are okay about doing this, maybe it would be possible <coughs> to fix some of the economic ideas so that more of the businesses would be um, accepted. The, the easy part of rescuing people is the only part that's getting any attention, which is <clears throat> rushing in like cowboys um, to liberate slaves in brothels. There are some real victims in there. The research that's taking place in those kind of detention centers and homes is completely disastrous about what's happening because there are no proposals for how to do this famous thing that you do for prostitutes, which is rehabilitate them, or and they're getting deported, and they don't want to be in repressive homes. I've visited them that have bars and that people cannot leave, and if they left, they don't have any rights. So you get riots in homes because of people wanting to get out, which is just what they did 200 years ago as well. So do if you think that rescue is a good idea, then you need to think through what will be the different steps after the police go in on their horses and round up all the people and take them to police stations where no one wants to denounce anyone.